Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I am your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali BBQ Media production. Every single week we talk about digital hospitality. That is our ongoing thesis. Every business needs to be digital first and every business needs to be in the hospitality business. What exactly does that mean? If you're a new listener, we are a barbecue restaurant that became a media company and we did that thanks to smartphone storytelling. So we learned how to leverage Facebook. We learned how to leverage our website, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, all these different tools, all these incredible apps on our phone to give people an idea and to build our brand so that people knew what we were doing. Once we learned those skills, we started sharing the story of all of our vendor partners about our community, and we became a media company. And part of what we do every week is bring experts on from all over the globe that are either in the marketing space, media space, hospitality space, self-improvement space, um, people that we admire so that you can learn more, so that you can learn and take the things that we talk about and implement them into your business, whether it's a hospitality business, whether you own a ghost kitchen, whether you own a restaurant, whether you own a professional business and you're just working on your personal brand, our goal is to be a resource to you. Uh, Every single week, we host a digital hospitality room on Fridays at 10 a.m. Last week, we hosted a room on ghost kitchens, and I was fortunate to meet today's guest. Today's guest, you can find him on Instagram at Manveer underscore Anad. Um, Manveer, welcome to the show. Been a pleasure, Sean. I mean, thanks for having me. You know, it's, uh, it's truly a pleasure on my end for you to jump into our clubhouse room, somebody with your expertise and background in the Indian hospitality market in India. Um, the work that you're doing, I went on your Instagram account, looked at all the content you're creating for cloud kitchens, for ghost kitchens, virtual kitchens, caterers, people that are in the digital food space, food entrepreneurs. Um, You have a catering podcast, you have a number one Amazon bestselling book, you've done TEDx speeches, Um, you're you're a prolific hospitality expert, and I couldn't be more excited to to have you on so that our our listeners can learn from you. Thank you so much. I think, you know, I mean, these are all all facets, the ideas to contribute back to the community. I think, you know, I I, I think hospitality is one industry which gives, you know, employment to one of the largest sex all across the world, you know, be it any part of the world you talk about, it's hospitality giving, giving back to the, to the entire nation in terms of nation building. So it's a pleasure doing this. And thank you so much again for having me here. Absolutely. It's truly an honor. And I think, you know, that's the, I mean, anybody that's a a fan of the show, you know, that I've been talking about clubhouse a lot. And a lot of the listeners, you guys have joined the clubhouse room. It's a, it's a platform that allows this audio platform. You guys are listening to this podcast. Some of you are watching on YouTube, but audio is a storytelling platform that allows you to listen to things that you care about. So you care about digital hospitality. You care about our thesis. You're a supporter of the show, but Clubhouse allows you to come and listen as well as raise your hand. So it allows you to get involved. And, you know, that's how I met Manveer. He came in, he raised his hand, he gave, he added value to the room because of his expertise. And, you know, I'm really excited to share that expertise. Tell me, tell me what is happening in, in India, in the, uh, in the ghost kitchen space. So, you know, it's a, it's a very different time. I really, Sean, you know what I mean? Uh, we used to always talk about about the QSR era, the, the restaurant era, the fine dines. And, you know, I think it's been globally, right? You know, with the pandemic coming in, you know, the entire concept of, of uh, you know, of the entire dine-in space, the takeaway space has gone, you know, has actually, you know, faced its worst beating. Though I always feel that, you know, it's, a, it's an industry which will stay for long and, you know, nothing can be, you know, we are social beings and somewhere or the other, the, the personal touch has to be there. But in the ghost kitchen space, or you know what we call here the cloud kitchen space, uh, that's really exploded. To give you a perspective, you know, right now, as per the best of national dailies, you know what you call Financial Times or the Economic Times uh, in India, it says that the cloud kitchen industry is expected to grow five times in the next five years. So right now, in the next one year, it should become a one billion dollar market, uh, at least in the Indian, Indian subcontinent space. To put that into perspective, right. Before the pandemic, this was just just honey, you know, probably around uh, around hundred million dollars broadly, yeah. you know. Wow. So that 10X. way you look, you're looking at ten x, and yep. you know what the new what the news says is is just is just a part of the pie. 
So my point is the interesting aspect is that all restaurants are becoming cloud kitchens, but cloud kitchens don't want to become restaurants. And that's 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 a very unique element which I'm seeing right now in the in the cloud kitchen space. And and that's something to really really look forward to. Yeah. Let's give our listeners some of those that aren't in the ghost kitchen space or cloud kitchen space some basic definitions. Can you explain what is a cloud kitchen? So cloud kitchen typically is a business where in which uh, you can the way I you know this is my definition of it where you get the comfort of starting your cloud your 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 own cloud kitchen business from the comfort of your home. You know it's basically uh, you know where uh, where in which you can set up a restaurant from the comfort of your home. Uh, it can it can typically what you need is uh, you don't need uh, you know you don't need to be in a high street retail location you don't need to be typically in uh, you know in a place you know with high rentals you can typically be on the top of a third floor of a building to a basement idea is that you know get your your requisite permissions done and you can start your business and get online because all the orders are typically received uh, received on the cloud. So there's no physical interface. There's only delivery dine in, and you just have a kitchen space, and and that's why the economics has changed. Because it's essentially, you know, I I always believe that you know when we talk about the hospitality industry, it's always location, location, location. Yes. However, in the cloud in the cloud kitchen space, you know, it's it's not about the location, location, location. It's just about being within the five kilometer radius of your customer, and that's the power of it. And that's why the economics of the cloud kitchen space has changed completely. And that's that, that's why I say that you can start your own restaurant from the comfort of your home because you just need the requisite licenses and you can just get started even from the basement of your garage, ideally of sorts. Yeah, yes. so yeah, that's, it's that's, incredible. that's what my, uh, my quick thoughts are. Can you can you talk about from the from the social media aspect? I mean, this is the thing that we talk about all the time on the podcast, but all these different social platforms that have allowed somebody that maybe never thought they would be in the restaurant space to now get into a cloud kitchen because they're cooking an amazing meal at home, but they're cooking it and they're sharing the media, they're sharing the content on Instagram or on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden people are going and looking at it and say, that looks amazing. Can I buy yeah. that? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I definitely feel, and, and you know, I always talk about uh, this aspect and I, I, you know, it will be good to get a perspective from you also. I've always mentioned during my, during my uh, reflection on the pandemic has been that there have been two revolutions, you know? The first revolution is around the cloud kitchen or the ghost kitchen space, uh, you know, which we talk about. Okay, that's the first revolution, where in which everyone's starting their restaurants. You don't need to be in a high street retail location. There's no contact. This is a contactless delivery business typically now, right? Yep. Second aspect is the home chef revolution. Everyone has become a home chef right now. I mean, you just think about it. You know, I mean, I see people in you know in this part of the world, you know. And it's specifically homemakers, uh, you know, students, you know, who didn't really know how to monetize. You know, a lot of people lost their jobs. So a lot of people had that shift towards towards uh, micro entrepreneurship, which is through home chefs and homemaker ent enterprise. Now, how did that come into be? Today, like I said, you get the comfort of starting a business from your phone. Why? Because everything is digital, right? So the so what is happening is there are four reasons why all this is happening. One is most importantly, there's a growing preference towards deliveries, typically of sorts, you know, which is fueling it because otherwise you have to go to a, go to a restaurant typically. Second is about, about with the growing awareness of global cuisines. Today, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Peruvian cuisine, at least in this part of the world, which is absolutely different from, from what, you know, an Indian subcontinent or in the Middle Eastern space we used to talk about. We're talking about uh, Tunisian cuisine. We're talking about Ethiopian cuisine, Jamaican cuisine. I mean, these are unheard things, at least in this part of the world, right? Sure. But the beauty is all of this is possible through the third and the most important aspect, which is called the rise of social media influence, wherein which you have content creators, you have food bloggers, and you have enthusiasts. Yep. All of them are sharing content. Today, Correct. it's all about what you rightly said. It's called digital storytelling. You know, you are not only building content around food, just sharing them, but you're sharing stories about how is it that you know the entire process is, is done if you see that somewhere or the other that element of fomo which is a fear of missing out is generated through the social media and that if 
any you know and, and i think every brand today understands and i think you know that's that's a very good pivot you've taken as a company and in fact we've taken as a company you know i mean uh, before that you know we, we were a hyper you know hyper uh, large catering form essentially of sauce but we understood in the pandemic that you can only cater to as much as 50 100 200 people so yeah. idea is today is all about creating content about building awareness about your cuisine about your expertise what what you bring on the table and it's all about sharing as well as caring about people through your your covid protocols and all of that and all that has to be communicated through your social media handles so in today's time what is the most important thing is storytelling it's about content everything is about content and i think it's just fueling it and i think in the next 3 years from now all this content once the market comes back to normal people who be at the top of the pyramid in terms of this are going to have a massive edge over people who just don't even got started and are not even thinking about that part yeah. am i right you're 100% right and i mean that's back to when we opened our restaurant in 2008 at the height of the economic recession here in the United States everybody told us we were crazy you shouldn't be opening a restaurant it's a risky business it's a terrible time to open and we picked a very difficult location 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 but now we're living in content 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 like the content that you're creating the keywords that you're using the ideas that you're spreading that is how people are going to find you and these platforms so many people they when when i talk to them it's they shut down because it's like i don't know how to do it it's the fear it's that ego based fear and i have to remember that there was a time that i was scared to talk in front of the camera as well i was scared to talk about barbecue because i'm from san diego i'm not from one of the barbecue meccas in the united states texas or st louis you know I had to get over my fear and then just be willing to go on the local news and share our story because no one's going to tell your story better than you. Whoever's listening to this podcast, if you're a food entrepreneur, if you made that dish at home, how did you make that dish? Why did you make that dish? Did mom make that dish when you were kids? Did your brother help making that dish? Share the story of the family roots and by sharing that you humanize the brand and you become relatable. That's what people want. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you know, just to add on to that Sean, I definitely believe in this concept of something called a social proof. Yes. Now, what a social proof? It's all about once I google you online what does the algorithm tell me about you yes now the moment i i i just google about you i can see this this plethora of 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 content about cali you know barbecue it sets you apart from a lot of people you know who who if you just google online there's nothing else right and that's the there's beauty nothing. of it correct you know and i always believe in this saying called perception beats reality yes you know and when we talk about perception beats reality once you need to you know once i search you online and i and i get that affinity that yes this brand is talked about you know they are doing so much of stuff it it induces me to order from you the Correct. second thing of course would be about your taste about their quality and so on and so forth but the first thing is to induce a customer and build that element of homo a fear of missing out that yeah. if i'm not trying from this person or that you know or or the said restaurant i'm missing out big time the second thing which i think you really mentioned beautifully i think you mentioned about a lot of people have that fear of not getting started how do i start you know how do i go about uh, you know typically creating creating content because somewhere or the other what used to be a frivolous activity four years five years back posting on a facebook uh, post or probably you know posting on instagram used to be a frivolous activity today yes. you know it's called it's it's, it's you know glamorously uh, you know in a, in a very glamorous term called uh, content creation or content creator of <laughs> that you're But, very right it used to be a frivolous activity and now people are starting to wake up and go oh wait my business actually should be on facebook <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> and you know and 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 one of the best things you know i have learned when and if you see you know that's something i'm practicing you know my words are where my money is typically i always say where you know it's not about to have the best content the best video and the best graphics sometimes quantity overpass quality yes because if you create and put out great quantity of content somewhere or the other people who resonate with your content you know start reaching out to you 
Correct. And that's one of the one of the best learnings I've taken from my podcast, Catering Success Podcast. I think nobody was looking at that or that on that niche of of catering as such. We leveraged upon that, and you know, I mean, I had people reaching out to me from Poland, from Warsaw, uh, you know, I mean, from from Tokyo. I mean, I'm just taken aback. I mean, you know, I mean, how is that possible? But yes. that's the beauty of it. If someone resonates and someone is in the same business, wants to just learn hardcore content, he just not he does not come, you know care about the quality of editing, but he cares about the content, and that's yes. the beauty of it. And that's what that's what uh, you know. I mean, one of the one of the most uh, you know pro- prolific uh, you know speakers on personal branding says uh, you know I mean Gary Vaynerchuk. I think yes. you know I mean he's he's actually inspired a generation in India. And I think you know I, you know if if I owe something to him, then that's you know that's the wild library you know what he had set up. So just 100%. I can just share, share that uh, share that from from that anecdote. Yeah, no, I mean at one hundred percent. The the thing for me with Gary Vaynerchuk was I I I've been running our barbecue business and I got a magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine, and on the cover was Gary Vaynerchuk. And usually I per, I go through the magazine. This was one of the first you know cover titles that I actually read. And as I was reading it, it was an entrepreneur and a businessman for the first time that was talking about social media as exactly what you said, social proof of business. He was literally doing what I had learned in Spring Valley with our own business through Facebook, through Yelp, through Twitter, through LinkedIn, all of these tools, these free tools of the internet where I was producing content, he was doing it at a much larger scale. But I said, wow, like, why aren't other people doing this? And that was the year that we launched our podcast. He started creating content about being a media company that resonated with me because we already were a media company, Cali barbecue media that it's, it was the natural progression. And it's what anybody that's listening to this podcast, I encourage you to do is that you are your own media company. You, somebody needs to give you permission. This is the permission. You're your own media company. You don't need to file any paperwork. Literally, you just need to start creating content. And I love what you said about the social proof and the Googling, because I Googled your name. And when I Google your name, what comes back? But all this rich results, rich results from the podcast that you have, the book that you've put out, the TEDx talk that you've done, your Facebook content, your Instagram content, it's all proof that you are doing, living and saying who you say you are, right? Absolutely. 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 Can you give our listeners advice? Because the for me, the unlock is the start because it's always the way I think of it is people are looking at their profile or their, pro, their Instagram feed or their LinkedIn feed or Google or the, how they show up on Google. And they think of it as like a museum. It has to be the most perfect paintings in the museum. And what you said in when you were talking about it was it's not about the perfect content. It's about the quantity because through the quantity, you learn what is going to work for you. Because what works for Gary Vaynerchuk doesn't work for you, doesn't work for me. I have to have my own voice, who I am. There's no one else that can tell the Cali barbecue media story the way that I can, because that's my story. No one can tell Manvir's story the way that you can tell your story. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, you know, what I will tell you, Sean, is I always believe in this, in this, uh, in this quote called your wife attracts your tribe, you know, and it's so true, right? Come to think of it, you know, I mean, somewhere or the other, why we are resonating and why we're in this conversation, because there is, you know, there is, you know, there is that sense of, of giving back to the community and at the same time talking about food businesses. Yeah. We and hospitality. We 100%. You know, yeah. You know, we were, we were you're up, about... you're up at one in the morning. It's one in the morning <laughs> that you're recording this podcast for our yeah. listeners, which will be repurposed, but you're doing that out of a, out of a love of hospitality and out of a love of content creation and knowing that this conversation is not going to just be gone. We're going to repurpose this content for all the different social platforms because we know that it might be one piece of content that somebody goes, Oh my God, I can start my business. What Manveer told me on that podcast inspired me to finally take my camera out and go in selfie mode. Sure, sure. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You know, the, the stories we tell are the stories we live. And these are the stories which end up inspiring, you know, if not to everyone, but even a one person. And I just want to want to share a small story with you because that's something very important for me. I just want to share that with you specifically. Uh, why I want to share that with you is, is a different topic I'll come to. 
but you know you you told me about this book you know which i just you know which i happen to write and it's and it's a best seller and so on and so forth and you know let me tell you one thing when i was writing this book you know this was the book was out of out of sheer 10 days of unemployment what do i mean by that when the pandemic struck in this country i was actually so to give you a perspective we we run a relatively uh, better known catering company in, in india we manage some of the largest events including an event like indian premier league which is one of the largest sports leagues which happen in this in this part of the country now from that to doing 5 10000 20000 people 50000 people mandates we were down to absolute zero zero you know i mean i can't even explain it in words that we didn't know what to do and in the 10 days of unemployment i didn't know what to do with my life you know i mean let's be very honest about that because you know you have a team looking back on to you you know you don't know what to tell them you know there are salaries gaping and so on and so forth so what i did was i started working on another startup idea which was around all Online aggregation and so on and so forth. But while I was making the SOPs for that, I thought if I'm making SOPs for my catering business, for example, you know, which is standard operating procedures, why can't I why can't I put this content of seven eight thousand words into a book format and just share it with people? And the thought was was something called the power of one, which I keep sharing. And you know, you I mean, I'm doing another TED talk in the coming week, which is on the power of one, wherein which what I'm trying to say is. If your content impacts even one person, yeah, you've done your job because right. somewhere or the other you're looking for audience, right? You know, if you create content, you're looking for the audience. But point is not about the audience; it's not about people who just look out and just forget in the feed, right? People are scrolling through the feed, they forget. But even if one or two people implement that, are able to build success stories, you have done your job, and that's just one person. And I was shocked. that in spite of launching the book and i didn't do much of marketing and so on and so forth just to let you know because this this is a new i mean i'm a caterer you know i mean by <laughs> heart i'm a caterer and a restaurant here you know i'm in the angel investing space but i don't understand writing a book right and that's why yeah. my editor had a had a very tough time working with me because he was like you've put great content out but you don't know how to write you're a shit writer <laughs> you know? that's that's what that, that that's what he told me right yeah. but the beauty is what that the amazon algorithm worked out for me why because the moment you launch a book and you know if there are organic sales happening you know it starts getting noticed and my point is a small initiative sitting you know i mean uh, you know i mean sitting sitting in in one of the first first sitting days of unemployment you know what it could come out with is not something which i had planned for but the idea was to just put out anything which would probably impact even one person and it did and in that process once it impacted one person that's how the ripple effect started happening but had i thought the first day that i will create a ripple from the from day one it would have never happened and that's that's that. the same with content creation that start off and impact that one person today you know when i say the why because your tribe you know it was so difficult for me to actually go out there and talk about catering and and and, and cloud kitchen concept because people want to talk about food they want to talk about recipes they want to talk about all these elements but the hard fact is how to monetize that food business yes these are elements what we're trying to teach and again this is not because i am a teacher my bread and butter still does not come from that but idea is so gratifying personally gratifying and that's that's the whole part of it and that's what content does i'm pretty much done speaking yeah i i love i love the fact that you share the the they talk about it in radio we're huge fans of talk radio and um, they talk about it in journalism but the audience of one you know literally making that content for one person and the problem that i see that so many people have even i have it is you want to make a piece of content that resonates that's engaging that goes viral so when you make a con- piece of content that only gets one comment or one like or one view it's disappointing because you're comparing it against everything else when all that matters is that you made the content you made the content and you published the content and that you resonated with one person then make more content like that because if that person engaged enough to make a comment that's powerful mm-hmm. you know and one of the things that i i heard on another podcast was it it was very profound for me but he was talking about if you're having trouble making content make content for yourself 5 years ago like if you were there five like you look how far you've come in 5 years talk to yourself 5 years ago about your hopes and dreams maybe you hadn't gotten to where you are in your journey but tell that person 5 years ago because there's somebody there 
Like we always look up to the Gary Vayner, you know, we're, we're always trying to level up. It's all oh, this person's doing what I'd like to do. David Meltzer, Sam, the cooking guy, all these people that I admire that are in my circle, Ariana Huffington, like these are all people that are, they're, they're titans of the industry. Tim Ferriss, you know, all these incredible Seth Godin, Simon Sinek, all these incredible people, but the, that's great to have idols. That's great to have people that you look up to, but you also have to remember, like, there's also a, a restaurant owner that hasn't opened his restaurant yet. And there's a lot of value that I can give. There's a lot of value as someone that you have organized all these incredible events, the most important sports entertainment events in India. That information is so valuable as the country start opening up, as the pandemic hopefully starts to subside. Um, but then you put it into a book. Like you did the work to put it into a book to give that gift. And now that gift is coming back to you in the form of you have a podcast, you have people all over the globe that are reaching out to you. You've put on a TEDx uh, speech. What's next for Manveer? So just, just trying to work on multiple things, but I just want to add one quick line to what you had just now said. And again, this is just from a content creation perspective because I've just become so passionate about content creation of late that I'm really trying to work uh, on, on multiple other projects around, around ed tech today. You know, we're doing a lot of stuff in ed tech. But uh, I always fundamentally believe, and, and this is something which you rightly summed up. You have to look at content from two perspectives. One is that building content is part of your legacy. Content online is immortal. Understand that, and I'm telling you this because that's a very deep thought. But at the same time, don't take it very seriously. It's, it's supposed to, it's a fun activity. It's something right. to, to enjoy. It's, you know, what, what we do at a clubhouse is not essentially just going there and giving, giving, uh, giving a talk and trying to show authority to ship. It's about connecting with professionals like yourself, connecting and forging synergies that tomorrow, if there's a synergy possible, and I'm speaking to a larger corporate who probably wants to set base, you know, there's a synergy possible, right? Yes. And you are, you know, we all resonate because of our of our content with each other. Correct. So my point is that whatever you're creating, think about it this way: that even if 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, or even if you're you're just 10 days before your death grave, you can look back onto that content and say that yes, I did something at least, and I'm proud of that. I had fun during my time, right? Yes. And the second part is, like I said, not take it very seriously. That even if it was not great. At least I, I did something out of the blue, right? So Correct. these were two, two really important aspects I just wanted to highlight on. Coming back to what is next next for us, I just wanted to share that that you know in the process of content creation, I happen to stumble. So I've been I've been into the angel investing space since a while because I'm really passionate about startups all throughout. So we started a new company called TKG Ventures, which is a consulting, coaching, and incubation initiative. Well, in which what we're doing is today we are working with over thirty hotel management colleges in India wherein which we are trying to build ed tech courses for them, uh, you know, as part of their, as part of their curriculums, you know, because, you know, the irony is we are talking about ghost kitchens. We're talking about cloud kitchens. The world is talking about them, but it's not part of any, any, any hospitality management curriculum. Yeah. You talk about a Cornell, Correct. you talk about any hotel management college in the U.S. also, they're not doing it. I think we as people in the industry, if we can take the initiative and really build, build, content and work on a, on a public private partnership with institutions uh, across these developing nations as well as as part of your your country i definitely feel there's a great opportunity and that's what we're trying to work on first second we have built an incubation initiative wherein which we are taking a 2.5 to 3% sweat equity as part of companies wherein which we are providing them access to capital resources and most importantly knowledge you know knowledge yeah. and know how to actually grow and scale up their business. We only take prototype companies. And that's how, you know, we're trying to now pivot towards that part because like I said, there's a lot of lot of content and, and, a, and, a, and a lot of education which we're trying to provide. For but, sure. you know, one of the most important thing, you know, which is very important for us to, to, is to see success stories. And if we, and, and if, even if, you know, out of the 20 portfolio companies which we have right now, even if I'm assuming two to three uh, companies actually, you know, end up becoming, uh, you know, a larger business of sorts. I think we build a much better business because then we are trying to build a more diversified business of sorts. So that's, that's, that's what I'm really thinking of. It's building a think tank 
which will really create uh, the next generation of food tech agri tech startups uh, which will again you know which i'll i'll love to share about you offline uh, about what is it that we are doing on yeah. I love it. I mean, that it, it couldn't be more important. And I'm so happy that you brought up, you know, the educational aspect, because it's so true. I mean, there's what I mean, I remember back, you know, 20 years ago, when I was in college, when I was taking business classes, and I just I was tuned out because the content that my business professor was supposed to be teaching me didn't engage me. I wasn't engaged. So I ended up studying sociology. But like to think that 20 years later, knowing that if I was in a university and I'm trying to learn about hospitality, like have they caught up to ghost kitchens? Have they caught up to third party aggregators? Have they caught up to what DoorDash is doing and Grubhub is doing and Uber Eats? And, you know, how are you supposed to create content for your ghost kitchen? Have they caught up? Are they creating courses for they haven't because we're all catching up. Literally, all of us are catching up every single day trying to figure that out. And it takes leaders like yourself, leaders like myself, all the people that are podcasting, that are networking, that are willing to share their voice and their knowledge, knowing that a rising tide lifts all ships. So if we can be better here in San Diego and we can produce content that's for the internet, that's available to anybody that's on the other side of the globe, whether they're in India or Bulgaria, where my wife is from, we know that there's going to create better hospitality, better digital hospitality for entrepreneurs. And we're bridging the gap with the technology companies that are coming into the hospitality space because Absolutely. they need us just as much as we need them. They need our feedback of what works and what doesn't work. So we can tell the engineers, this doesn't work. You need to improve Absolutely. it, not just for me, but for everyone else that owns a ghost kitchen. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you know, one of the most in in interesting trends I'm seeing is, and I don't know whether you know about that or not, that India had one of the most high, highest valued startups, which actually, you know, filed an IPO recently called Sumato. If you've heard of that, you know, yeah, 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 so yeah. Sumato had filed for a, for a 1 lakh crore IPO, 1 lakh crore typically in, in the US terms would be approximately a, a, at least a minimum of around $15 billion kind of an IPO, which is a wow. large IPO. That, that's, wow. the, that's the kind of volume. And a food tech startup. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's that's the beauty of it. But yep. like I said, it's an aggregator platform, so the economics are different. But like you rightly said, today what we're trying to do is, because we have, so and just to let you know, we have a community of 400 entrepreneurs who are budding entrepreneurs who are doing our courses and learning from us. Uh, you know, learning from us and you know, a couple of experts, you know, part of the panel, which we are, which we are working with. And the best thing we are trying to work around is that we are trying to work. Why I told you about the incubation initiative, because today we have a set market of these people, you know, who are actually wanting to start their business. Yes. If we can build solutions for them to test upon. So yes. the process becomes much more simpler. And that is where the technology with the product market fit, what we talk about, that it can really work out. And that's, that's a great opportunity. I absolutely resonate with your thought on that. That's huge. No, that's, uh, it's huge. It's exciting. And for me, you know, to have conversations with you, you know, somebody that's a leader and a true pioneer, the fact that you're willing to get your hands dirty and you're not only willing to get your hands dirty, but share. And I think that's probably why, you know, the Gary Vaynerchuk's of the world for us, it's such a different business model before when you live in secrecy and you're trying to keep things on, oh, this is how we cook the barbecue. Literally, we make videos to teach <laughs> other people how we Absolutely. make our barbecue because Absolutely. it's not about, we're not worried about somebody, like, good luck, go ahead, open up another barbecue restaurant. And you, you, no matter what, even with our recipe, you can't cook the same barbecue. You can't make the same experience. Agreed. You can't have the same Absolutely. hospitality. You can't hire the same, because it, it's just not possible. So why not share it? Why not share the information? Because there's a global audience that you can make an impact, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, somewhere or the other, you know, the beauty of this organic content is that once you're open, you know, I always say that once you open about these things, your wife attracts your tribe. And there are a lot of people in the community who just come in just to try that, you know, that, you know, I missed out on that part. I want to have your, your particular, uh, you know, dish. I want to try it. I think, uh, you know, if you've heard of this, uh, Nuzrit, Nuzrit barbecue, if you've heard of that, you know, uh, uh -huh. uh, you know, I mean, if, if you, you know about him, it's a, he's a, he's a very, very prominent chef. What's his name? His, 
Nuzret, uh, Nuzret, I'm forgetting the salt base, salt base. Oh, of salt course, base. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you yeah, he's an internet I, sensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, you know. Of course. I, and I, th I think the way he's built that entire concept of storytelling, and Shazan Burak, you know, he's another Turkish chef. You know, the way I'm seeing them trying to build recipes, I mean, nobody can replicate them as such, you know, because everyone has their own intellectual property. But the very fact of giving the other person that feeling that it's so, it's a cakewalk, it in itself is a way to make him try. And in that process, it, it, he's engaging with your brand. I always say it's an yes. extension of your brand by building content, right? And I, and again, if that content becomes shareable, you're even better known. As it. And I think nobody better than Salt Bay is a perfect example of how he's monetized the food business and built an, an empire out of that. He's built an correct. empire out of that in respect. Yeah, no, so correct. Of, yeah. Are and you are you on TikTok? Uh, so actually, TikTok is banned in India, apparently. It's banned in India, really? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely you know, so a, banned in India. <laughs> there's there's an India-China divide, apparently, you know, so it's a Chinese app and so on and so forth. Oh, wow. Uh, that's why you know Indian content is pretty much on reels. So that's that's the but that <laughs> yeah. So you're making you're making the reels for for uh, I saw that your reels your Instagram page is awesome. We're gonna put links in the show notes, um, sure. but I do want to give you an opportunity to give anybody that is thinking about getting into the ghost kitchen business some some advice, something things that they should be thinking about. So you know I'll I'll probably give give three three perspectives. Which again, you know, because I try to follow a framework for everything which I talk about. Uh, you know, the first and the most important thing is that you never make big money by focusing on retail profits. When I talk about big money, you make big money through either going in the franchise route or probably getting into, uh, you know, a brand collaboration of sorts or getting in a, you know, a, a, you know, a private equity venture capital fund or probably build a brand, sell the brand as it is. Yeah. That's where you make the big money. You never make money by trying to sell 100 sticks and trying to cut corners there and try to make me profit. So the first thing is to think like a brand and because you know, you're know you invisible, right? The most important thing in intellectual property as part of your brand is is, is the, the, the look and feel you exude. And that's why I don't try and cut corners on that part. So first is think big, think like a brand. Second is build a niche. The riches are in the niche. No matter what you're doing today is not a time in which, uh, you know, I mean, you can be everything for everyone. You can't like, you know, in Cali, Cali barbecue, you're known for barbecue, right? But, you know, if, if on the on the contrary, in, 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 in a lot of parts of, parts of the country, either be it be it the Middle Eastern part of it or Indian context of that, that way, people want to keep everything for everyone. They want to keep Indian also, they want to keep Spanish and also, they want to keep continental also, everything. But you need to understand that when people are placing your their orders online, the most important thing they're looking for is that particular dish. So yep. if they want to have a barbecue stick. They want to have a stick. They don't want to have like, like, you know, a pasta along with, with like an Indian curry and so on and so forth. So don't mix it up. Nowadays is the time of building a micro niche and micro niche is about going as detailed on the cuisine. So if I do Indian, I will just do a curry house. I will not try to try, try to pitch my, my, uh, my starters and so on and so forth. And that's how it pretty much works. So that's the second part. Build a niche. Very important. Third, market, market, market yourself. You know, after one month of your business, you know, I definitely tell this to a lot of people. It's all about building organic and inorganic reach for your brand. Because your first, after your first month, once you're done with the operation issues, it's all about building a massive word of mouth, as well as creating a lot of content, social proof, which I was discussing to you about that, you know, I mean, either it's Google My Business, it is your WhatsApp for business. It's your online, you know. So I always say, when I say market, 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 it's it's about building multiple revenue streams. So I think number one mistake for a lot of cloud kitchen operators is they depend on aggregator income itself. And it's a pure play disaster for anyone. And, and that's what, you know, a lot of people don't share with them. You yeah. have to have four income streams. First is, of course, your aggregator income. Because if you're on DoorDash, you're on, on Zomato, you're on any overreach for that matter. You know, that revenue is important because, you know, they're investing the dollars. They are, you know, they're doing whatever they're doing, but it's like the Amazon essentially, right? Yep. You get discovered there. So that's why you need to be there. But you need to build a Shopify also. Yep. You need to build your own own direct delivery. That's absolutely quintessential. So that's the second part of your revenue source. 
Third is about building some sort of a subscription service so that your revenues are predictable. Come what may, so that you know you can come up with a with a box meal or something of that sort, which resonates with offices or somewhere of that sort. You know, who can order from your daily. And the fourth and the most important is B two B, catering parties, whatever you do. Build multiple income dependency. Don't focus on one because that's a sure shot recipe for failure. So these are my three thoughts. First, think like a brand. Second, build a niche. And third, market, 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 and build multiple revenue streams. That's pretty. That much was it. that was incredible masterclass. Those were all <laughs> phenomenal, and the way that you laid them out. I mean, I love the the focus too. The the riches in the niches because being coming an Indian food concept, even if you're here in San Diego, it no longer works. What is your mm -hmm. niche within Indian food? Because that's what people are looking for. You know, we have a friend that's developing an app called the Aid It app. And literally instead of the way that you search on Uber Eats and Yelp and all these other platforms, he's building it. If you're searching for hot dogs or bratwurst or you know, uh, a burger or a chicken sandwich. It's going to give you the best chicken sandwiches, not the best chicken restaurants, but the best chicken sandwiches. Absolutely. You know, Maybe. it's very, very smart because that's what the niches are. And, that, and that's how people, that's how we think. That's how we want to eat. You think Absolutely. about what, what do you want to eat? It's a dish. You don't think of a cuisine. And you know, when, um, when, when, when people are ordering online, they want to order from specialists and no generalists. In a restaurant, the economics is different. Why? Because once a person has come inside a restaurant, you want to attract him from all sides. You can sell whatever you want to because you have his attention. But when you know you are you are prying for attention, and you know the biggest currency in today's time, at least in the social media content space, or anyone you know who's targeting ads, he will tell you that the biggest currency is attention. Yep. You know, one hundred percent. And problem is that that you know if you're doing twenty things together and you don't have a niche. My point is, I give, I, I, you know, I ask, I ask you this, this question, right? If do I go to any American restaurant or I go to Cali's barbecue? I'll go to Cali's barbecue because there's a barbecue speciality. And if I want to have a barbecue, I want to have a steak. I'll come to you. I'll not go to any random, random uh, cookhouse who's doing everything under the sun because that's where you know we know that that you're a specialist, and that's what people are looking at online because it's, it's a, it's a very different ball game in terms of online ordering vis-a-vis -vis a restaurant business typically of sorts such good information i hope you guys caught that and when you're ordering digitally you want to order from a specialist not a generalist couldn't be more true that was very very well said um what's the best way if uh listeners if they want to reach out and um, connect with you to to learn more so the best way is instagram or linkedin i think i'm relatively active on, on both the platforms and happy to connect happy to probably chat and add value in any possible way, way i can and uh, yeah that's pretty much from my side, yeah. Well, Manvir, I'm, I'm so grateful to have met you. I look forward to continuing to connect with you. You know, if you're ever in San Diego or in the United States, I, I know that you'll connect with me so I can show you what we're doing. And um, if when I make it to India, not if, but when I make it to India, that's the beauty of podcasting is it's these deep, deep connections with people that, Absolutely. you know, you, you said it beautifully. It's the, the why attracts your tribe. And, you know, we're a rising tide. The rising tide lifts all ships. Um, if you're listening to this podcast, you're a ship. Um, we want you to reach out. We want you to stay curious. We want you to get involved. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, you know, you guys can reach out to me at Sean P. Walchef. Uh, we're going to put links in the show notes. Ian, our lead writer, is going to write up an article on Manveer in this episode. Stover is going to weave everything together like a master, and then Toby will be pushing it out. But um, Manveer, uh, when this episode airs, I'd love to have you come on a Friday um, clubhouse so that we can talk more about what we talked about on the podcast, but open it up to our listeners. Uh, are you down for that? Sure. Beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward. And I'm looking forward to seeing you, seeing you in India. Daddy, oh, yeah, Mumbai, Chennai, any place, let me know. I'll be there. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, you got it. Yeah. You got a deal. You'll be my first call. I, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, we really Beautiful. appreciate it. And um, thank you for, for being awake at one in the morning. Uh, you're, you're a true digital pioneer. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.